ಓಂ ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೋ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯಂ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿ ನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಮೇ ದ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟ್ ಅಸ್ ಬೋತ್ ಟೀಚರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ಟಾಟ್ ಟುಗೆದರ್ ಬೈ ರಿವೀಲಿಂಗ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಮೇ ಹಿ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟ್ ಅಸ್ ಬೋತ್ by giving us the results of knowledge may we attain vigor together let our study be invigorating may we not cavil at each other om peace 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 so the story goes um we've been reading in kathopanishad very famous and ancient story of the little boy nachiketa who went to the house of death and asked him the question about the atman so that's the setting so it started off with uh, uh, with the, we are introduced to the bai nachiketa and his father vajashravasa the vajashravasa this uh, vedic brahmin he was performing a big fire ritual with the purpose objective of going to heaven then his son noticed that he was not giving away the gifts as he was supposed to and he was you know keeping the good stuff for himself and giving away uh the not so good stuff and then um, nachiketa asks him to whom do you want to give me and persists in asking him so his father you know he, he sees it as impertinence but nachiketa wants to point out that one should hold on to the truth uh, in this world and in the next also it is truth that matters values that matter, matter and basically his father is just cheating himself uh, cheating the society by uh, not doing what he was supposed to do but his father sees it as impertinence and says i'll give you to death they like go to the house of death and so nachiketa goes to the house of death and we know that um, death yamaraja the lord of death was away on tour or something and he was not at home he comes back after 3 days and nachiketa has not eaten anything uh, and he's just sitting there waiting for yamaraja to come back the lord of death to come back so immediately when he arrives um, um his we don't know who because those voices are not mentioned but somebody tells him so maybe his wife maybe his counselors or his minions or whoever it is um they tell him that so this guest has come to your house this little brahmin boy has come to your house he enters your house like fire so the fire imagery is uh, evocative because fire can uh, do a lot good to us and can burn down our house also so fire gives us illumination and fire gives us warmth uh, but fire when it is not used properly can you know sort of burn everything to ashes similarly so this guest has come this esteemed guest has come to your house by his blessings by his good wishes you may attain to knowledge illumination you may attain to goodness in life or by neglecting him um you know it's very bad karma so that was said go to him and attend him immediately carry to him water for washing his feet and giving him water to drink and food to eat and so on and greet him so we met imagine these things are fill in the blanks and the commentator shankaracharya helps us here sub commentators help us here the upanishad itself does not give us the, all these details we may imagine that the lord of death yamaraja now goes to the boy who is still waiting outside outside the door and uh, again there is something that the upanishad tells us we are not sure who is saying this you know what is the harm if you neglect if you neglect your duty towards a guest so there is a verse about this a mantra eighth mantra so the story is going on so in these mantras it's not exactly vedanta we are not talking about the ultimate reality we are not talking about pure consciousness existence bliss we are not talking about the highest goal of human life we are not talking about meditation um, but the values are being taught here which are foundational to vedanta so that's important what's the harm if if the lord of death or indeed anybody neglects a guest and makes a guest suffer eighth mantra आशा प्रतीक्षे संगत सुनृता ईष्टापूर्ते पुत्र पशुंश्चर्वान् 
ಎತದ್ಬೃಂಗ್ತೆ ಪುರುಷಸ್ಯಲ್ಪಮೇಧಸೋ ಯಸ್ಯನಶ್ನನ್ ವಸತಿ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣೋ ಗೃಹೆ ಇಫ್ ಇನ್ ಎನಿ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಅ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ್ ಗೆಸ್ಟ್ ಅಬೈಡ್ಸ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಫೂಡ್ ದಟ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಾಯ್ಸ್ ಹೋಪ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟೇಷನ್ ದ ರಿಸಲ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಹೋಲಿ ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸ್ವೀಟ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಯಾಕ್ರಿಫೈಸಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಚಾರಿಟೀಸ್ ಸನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕ್ಯಾಟಲ್ ಆಲ್ ದೀಸ್ of the man of little imp- uh, intelligence so that's really bad karma huh? um all of these are lost if uh, the guest is is uh, neglected little more detail here the words used asha pratiksha asha and pratiksha so these are the actually names used in uh, india girls names you know asha i don't know if anybody's named pratiksha are they named pratiksha asha definitely so what do they mean the difference between asha and pratiksha is and shankaracharya helps us out here so he gives these nice little notes so if anything you you're not very sure whether you're going to get it something you want something you, you're not very sure you're going to get it but you are hoping that you'll get it so there's this maybe for example somebody you haven't met in ages you know sort of hoping that one of these days that person will turn up you don't know you don't have any information you're just hoping or anything whatever you like in life whatever you want whatever one wants in life we are hoping we'll get it we are hoping that will happen hoping that person will come um so whatever you are hoping but there is no no specific information that is going to happen that's called asha hope and pratiksha is expectation expectation is there's something you want and you know you are expecting it to happen maybe your salary is due or there's a guest who has what is it called um you know when you when you say that i'm going to uh, i'm going to attend rsvp yes rsvp i was going to say rip that's rest in peace not rsvp <laughs> so you know, when the guest has rsvp you know he's going to come he or she is going to come or some money is due to you or some the new apple phone is being released you know for sure it's going to happen and you're just waiting for it to happen Uh, something very nice that is called pratiksha expectation so nice distinction between hope and expectation we sort of knew all this i mean it's of sometimes in these commentaries you get answers to questions you never asked and uh, no answers to questions which you you want to know the answers to so anyway cute distinction between hope and expectation but the dark thing is these are lost what you hope for won't happen if you have neglected the guest what was expected to happen you are sure good things are going to come to you won't happen if you have neglected the guest if you have been um, you know you have been arrogant or neglectful now remember the lord of death yama was not neglectful on uh, on purpose only inadvertently um, but still then sangatam so sangatam um shankara acharya here uh, he gives the meaning as the connection with uh, with connection with the um the association with holy people so the, the association with the holy you no know, satsang with a spiritual person with a holy person it has two kinds of benefits one is the direct benefit that you get spiritual knowledge you attend a vedanta class or you ask questions and you get some knowledge out of it but it's supposed to be very good karma you see this is something that is well understood in india in, in all the indian religions um in hinduism of course but also jainism um and buddhism and sikhism also that you go to a person you know to be saintly or holy and quite apart from above and beyond the knowledge that you gain from that visit it's just good karma for you to be in the association with the holy and there's a reason for that in one of the upanishads it says um atmagyam hi archayet bhuti kama mundaka upanishad says the enlightened one the one who, who has realized the self or realized brahman you should uh, approach such a one and serve this this enlightened one this saint him or her who 
the person who even if you have worldly desires even such a person so this is well understood in india so even a person who has no particular interest in vedanta or spirituality just wants good stuff in this world um, or to overcome bad karma or to go to heaven after death that person would still you know go to uh, a swami or, or a mata ji or somebody and and uh, you know bow down and offer gifts the idea being it's very good karma the upanishad says do that because such people have enormous good karma these holy people they have enormous good karma which they will not use because what is good karma meant for for getting pleasant stuff in this world and for going to heaven after death like nachiketa's father was trying to do perform a vedic sacrifice which will generate lots of good karma and then he goes to heaven afterwards but so the, the holy ones they have attained enlightenment or they are seeking enlightenment they don't want uh, artha and karma pleasures and wealth and you know power and success and status in this world they don't even want it um, even if it was they won't try for it even if it was offered to them they won't take it and they are not even interested in going to heaven after death they want enlightenment and freedom but then what happens to all the good karma they have so uh, hindus are very worried about the calculus the balance of karma so that so the huge surplus of good karma which they are not going to use so it is said that it's a strong belief that those who serve them those who are close to them those upon whom they are pleased uh, whom they bless they get the benefit of that uh, good karma why is it that the blessings of holy people are supposed to be effective it's because of uh, they are very clear the uh, hindu philosophers it has to be somewhere somewhere good karma is being used up where is that surplus coming from it's that holy person's good karma enormous amounts of good karma which you get and again the warning here is you lose that um another meaning of this sangatam is the connection with the results of all your you know religious and spiritual activity which is swarga moksha those who want you're doing a lot of rituals so that one goes to heaven after death does not want moksha but wants to go to heaven after death so the connection with that result you have done all the what has to be needed what is what's needed to be done and so now you expect to go to heaven after death won't happen why because you neglected the guest or you misbehaved with the guest and also for us those who are here we are interested in enlightenment and moksha freedom and that's our goal spiritual liberation nothing worldly that also is blocked and an obstruction comes up for that if um, one neglects the guest so very strong warnings moksha phala swarga phala the result of heaven after death and the result of enlightenment and spiritual freedom both are blocked then sunritam sunritam means uh, good literally means good speech uh, beneficial speech so the speech that you have when you talk to a good person a holy person uh, which is beneficial for you those be- those benefits the benefit of that speech is lost speech is supposed to even your own speech which is supposed to be highly beneficial if you um uh, the the rules are the hitam cha mitam cha satyam cha satyam cha hitam cha mitam cha the benefits of truth speaking the benefits of speaking um, the beneficial thing you know like you're saying the truth and that which is helpful for others and mitam mitam means limited don't speak too much um, also it means sweet not harsh so there's a well known saying in india satyam vada and then sweet tell the truth yes priyam vada ma vada satyam apriyam so it's a well known saying tell the truth tell that which is sweet or tell it sweetly and don't say something that is not uh, that is harsh it may be true but it's also harsh i mentioned this earlier i like this you know mark twain one in one place he says with this characteristic humor he says that those who claim you know they are very proud of that we like the brutal uh, honest or but brutal truth we like the brutal truth often mark twain says i have noticed they are more fond of the brutality than the truth <laughs> so 
but all of those careful speech that you're disciplined in speech the benefit of that is lost if the guest is not taken care of then ishta purtam uh, ishta purta are two kinds of practices which a religious person a devout person in vedic times was supposed to undertake um ishta means all those vedic sacrifices so the religious rituals of a devout vedic person in those times they were called ishta ishta is one of the name is uh, is a name for vedic rituals actually yagya and purta are all the social um, service activities um activities of charity and generosity so these are the things that you are supposed to do as a devout person and they generate good karma Uh, so there are a lot of discussions on this what are these ishta and purta let me read out a little bit so for example so now i'm explaining the words ishta and purta this is from the atri sanghita atri sanghita um agnihotram tapas satya vedanam jaiva palanam atithyam vaishvadevam cha ishtam ityabhidhiyate um so what comes under ishta agnihotra the daily vedic ritual then tapa austerities like fasting satya holding on to the truth vedanam jaiva palanam regular practice or chanting of the vedas which is the vedas were divided according to family you know so you had a branch of the vedas which you are supposed to protect protect means um read it chant it regularly and teach it to the next generation so that's part of the ishta atithyam so taking care of the guest notice so it comes in here honoring the guest vaishvadevam cha so some certain sacrifices for example they required you to so take care of the environment plants and animals and trees and feed the uh, Uh, birds and um, you know dogs and cats and all so all of the living beings all of these together are known as ishta and you lose the fruits of all of this if you don't take care of the guest then what is the purta the other kind of activity the sec- these are all said to be devotional or religious activities connected to, with the vedas then there is a set of activities which are secular which is for the welfare of society again this is from the atri sanghita what is meant by purta what activities vapi kupa tadagadi devayatana devayat devayatanani cha anna pradanam arama purtam ityabhidhiyate so vapi means um, like a big pond and so you make a big pond at like a place which the people of the village or the town can use you sponsor it digging that big pond kupa is a well digging a well taraga is a sort of in between source of water not as small as a well not as big as a big pond but these are all sources of water and you can see how important water was to an agrarian civilization devayatana a place of worship a house of worship you make a house of worship anna offer food to the hungry upavana etc um, like make a park or you know like donate to a park you can see all of that you know in any good society right here if you see all the volunteer activities the charity activities um, right now you're right here you have the central park for example how much of it is maintained by the donations of um, of charitable people how much of it it depends on the volunteer activity of so many people working you know in teams and cleaning up the place and so all of this is called purta um which goes to maintaining a healthy society again we lose all the benefits of this the good karma from all the purta by neglecting the guest then what else is there one more point i'd like to point out here is the importance of the guest so that's another thing it's just a little bit of a tangent but it's a big thing in uh, indian civilization indians even till today are known for their hospitality but this goes way back in from ancient times there was a great stress on taking care of uh, the atithi and the word atithi is very interesting it means 
without, uh, literally without appointment. So someone who drops in on you, <laughs> Titi means a particular date. There's no particular date he's, he's coming. I mean, he's just, this, uh, this person visits you. Of course, with the appointment or without appointment, but a guest. Um, couple of quotations. This is from the Manu Sanghita. Sampraptaya tu atitaye um, pradadyat asana udake. So when the guest comes, immediately offer a seat and offer water. Annam jaiva yatha shakti satkritya vidhipurvakam. Uh, honor the guest satkritya as you know, like whatever the protocol or the, or the formalities are for that particular kind of guest. And then offer food um, yatha shakti up to your capacity, whatever you can offer, uh, you should offer food to the guest. Um, all the all your the Manu Sangita says, uh, Sarvam Sukritam Adatte Brahmanor Anarchito Vasan. So, all of this, all the good things that you do are lost if a guest, an honored guest, like a Brahmin guest, for example, comes to your house and is not honored, is not taken care of, so all everything is lost. So, this sort of you can see it's in line with what the Lord of Death Yama is saying. And the Manu Sanghita um, backs this up. It's also in the Vedas. There's a quotation from the Atharva Veda, um, which says that one should not eat before the guest has eaten. So the best things that you have, offer it to the get guest. Tasmat purvo nashniyat. Before the guest has e eaten, before the guest has been offered the best that you have, do not eat yourself. Manu Sangeeta also says, Atithi stu indra lokesha. The guest is verily the dweller of the world of Indra, or the lord of the world of Indra, which is Indra, the god, lord of the gods. So that kind of honor is given to the guest. Okay. That's a lot about the Atithi, about the guest. What else has been said here? So, Ishta and Purta are lost. Putra Pashungscha Sarvan. Um, children um, and cattle. Why cattle? Cattle was wealth in those days. All of these are lot. Not lot, lot literally. You may not literally lose uh, your kids or your um, cattle, but just that things don't go well uh, for the family, for your property, and all of that. Etad Vrinkte. The word Vrinkte means set aside. Uh, but literally, it means here lost. So the technical, uh, the etymology will here mean it's lost. For whom? Purushasya alpa medhasya. For that man, for that person who is of low in, low intelligence. So it's an intelligent person who takes care of the guest. At this point, we'll say, okay, we got the point. The guest is king. Our guest is queen. We got it. Now... By this time, the Lord of Death must be thoroughly frightened because the guest has been ignored and he's going to lose everything now. So he comes and he speaks now in the mantra number nine. So now he's speaking. Um, death is speaking to the boy Nachiketa. Tisro ratrir yadavat me anashnan brahman atithir namasya Namaste astu brahman swasti me astu tasmat prati trin varan brinishwa. O Brahmin, since you have lived in my house for three nights without food, a guest and an adorable person as you are, let my salutations be to you and let good accrue to me by averting the fault arising from that lapse. Ask for three boons, one in respect of each night. That means each day and night with which you have spent at my doorstep. So notice he uses the word Brahman, O Brahman, twice. So it's showing how much respect he has for the little boy who is waiting. So Yama, you can imagine, Lord of Death must be a very impressive personality. And here is just this little boy who's not even 10 years old. Um, somebody told me something very interesting yesterday that uh, it seems 
child psychology is uh, one of the things that they have come upon is children at the age of seven or eight is the first time they um, become aware uh, of mortality or death. The concept becomes understandable. Sometimes children get traumatized by the first understanding of that possibility, what death actually means. I don't know whether a child cannot understand it before that or but anyway, seven or eight. It's very interesting that Nachiketa is seven or eight years. Uh, that's been mentioned there. And the question he's, he's going to the house of death. And the question he's going to ask is about death. What happens after death? What's the whole secret of death? Interesting connection. So he has waited three nights. Tisro Ratri, he has waited three nights. Brahman Natiti, oh, oh guest, oh you Brahmin boy, Namasya, you are. Namaste. I, I offer you my salutation. Swasti meyastu, let good fortune attend to me. So swasti, normally the word used in uh, Sanskrit, swasti means good fortune. So good karma, good fortune, that is symbolized by swasti. Here it means, one of the derivative meanings by, by a commentator is, swasti means avinasha, non-destruction. Non-destruction of what? non-destruction of all my good karma. So he knows. The problem is that I, I stand to lose a lot because I've neglected you. Unless you are happy, unless I can make you happy, I stand to lose a lot. So let me not lose that. This is what he is. He has good fortune. He is the Lord of death. He is enormously powerful, but that he does not want to lose. Tasma Prati Trin Varan Raneshwar. So he offers him, this is a famous part of the story where he offers him three boons. I want to make up. So three nights and three days you have spent at my door in utter neglect. So, and I didn't intend that to happen, but still it happened. So I'm going to make up for that by offering, offering you, offering thee three boons. Ask what you want, whatever you want, I'll fulfill it. He's enormously powerful. He's one of, he's, Yama is still one of the gods with a small g, but one of the most powerful gods, um, like Indra, the king of the gods, Agni, the god of fire, Varuna, the god of uh, water uh, on the ocean, and uh, Vayu, the god of air. Yama is another very powerful, one of the principal, like um, cabinet secretaries or something like that. <laughs> uh, so he can offer three boons. A little... Um, Again, a little tangent at this point. Something, um, you know, it, it struck my memory. Uh, it just came up. Years ago, in Calcutta, in the Institute of Culture, this very noted scholar, pundit, traditional pundit. So he asked, sort of rhetorically, I think, that uh, what more did Vivekananda um, say, or what, more, what new idea did he give? about you know, the service of humanity. It's all there in Ishtapurta, the words which we used. So the traditional Vedic teaching of um, the Ishta, the, the Vedic rites and the service of guests and so on, all those things we read about. Plus the Purta, all the secular do-good activities in society. You, know, you take care of society, make sure people are comfortable, you give in, in charity. That's it, it's all there. So when Swami Vivekananda says you serve the poor and all that, what, what new thing? I mean, what, what is this big thing you all, you all means we monks in the Ramakrishna mission, we make about Swami Vivekananda's karma yoga. On. What is, he was a philosopher. So he says, philosophically, what's new? Philosophically, practically, what's new? Both as an idea and it's in its effect. What is so revolutionary? It's all there thousands of years ago, even before the Upanishads. In the Karma Kanda, in the ritualistic portion of the Vedas, it's all well set out, set out and nicely codified, and people practiced it. There are these big movements in the idea of spiritualizing work. So one is all these uh, do good activities, this charity, uh, this um, philanthropy, which was there for the benefit of all, and this would give you good karma. Remember, the motive was. You get a lot of good karma out of it and you go to heaven or your life is much better because of it. That was the motive. And this was a kind of personal charity that you would do as your religious duty and depending upon the wealth that you have. That was one idea. What Krishna did much later in the Bhagavad Gita when he taught Arjuna, he says, not charity. 
all your activities. If you now, you want enlightenment, moksha, God realization. Now, what do you do with your life? The old Vedic idea was that uh, as long as you're a householder, be a devout Vedic householder. And yes, you will do good. You'll take care of your own life and uh, do good to society. How do you do good? These things, ishta, purta, charity, philanthropy. That was the idea. And if you want to become enlightened, um, free of the entire cycle of birth and death, free of the whole thing, then give up all that, all that ishta, purta and all of that, Give up the worldly pursuits. Give up other worldly pursuits. Don't try to go to heaven also. Uh, become an ascetic, a spiritual seeker, uh, and uh, go to the master. Learn the Upanishads, Shavana, Manana, Nididhyasana. A very austere life of total renunciation. And engage in uh, study and listening to the teachings of Vedanta. Um, then, then reason upon it. And then once you have understood it, stay with it. In, in deep, consistent long meditation upon it till you become enlightened and you're free. What about uh, the philanthropy and uh, the, uh, the do-good activities, you know, the charity? Now see, what happens is you can't do it because you've given up all the means to do charity. And anyway, that's a distraction. Now notice, so there's there a very clear distinction between karma kanda, the ritualistic portion, the activities of a householder, be a devout, good householder. And uh, if you want more than that, give up the whole thing and become monk or monk-like and go all out for enlightenment through Vedanta. What Krishna said to Arjuna was, was he revolutionary. He said, you continue to be, this, is, this transition is internal. It's not an external thing. It's not that you actually give up your activities, your family, your the world way of life. You may or you may not. But what is essential is, you must transform the whole paradigm of what you are doing. The uh, Vedic ritualist has the paradigm of, I am this individual, I'm trying to make a, I'm trying to live the best possible life I can. Let me live a, an honorable life, a moral life, be good here and go to heaven after death. Yes, I'll come back again, but I'll keep ensuring that I have a good ride because I've got good karma. And the other one was, no. All of this is samsara. It's good samsara. It's still samsara. Swami Vivekananda said, chains though of gold are not less strong to bind. Then off with them. Say Om Tat Sat Om. Off, off with them sannyasi bold. Oh monk, cut those chains. Even the good ones. Good ones, good work. Vedic ritualism, Ishta, Purta, all of that. Krishna said, this transformation has to be internal. Oh Arjuna, you were seeking... The kingdom, that's why you have come to fight this battle. You were seeking to punish the wrongdoers. You were seeking revenge for what had been done to Draupadi. All of that, notable, good, but worldly goals. Good, moral, but worldly goals. Now you say, I don't want to fight. I don't want the kingdom. What is the point of a kingdom with, you know, by which I have to, for which I have to kill my relatives? And Krishna, Arjuna says that it's soaked in the blood of my relatives. Well, how would I enjoy it anyway? So Krishna says, fine, here is the old Upanishadic idea of enlightenment. In the second chapter of the Gita, Krishna just talks about entirely about the Upanishadic idea of enlightenment. You will see sometimes he quotes from the Katopanishad here uh, in the Gita. Now Arjuna's idea would be, okay, I've heard of this earlier. So that means I don't want to be a, a warrior anymore. I don't want to be a prince, a father. I don't want to be a person in society. I'm going to go off and become a monk and search for enlightenment. And Krishna says, stop. There is another way. You continue to be what you are and transform your activities, whatever activities you are doing, into, from karma into karma yoga. Karma yoga is transforming our actions, our daily actions, um, you know, in the family, in the office, in your workplace, in community. Instead of doing it for good karma and good life here and going to heaven, now you do it for Vedanta, for enlightenment. How will that help? That will prepare the mind, build the character. Then only Vedanta works. The qualifications which Vedanta insists on, high moral and ethical qualifications, discipline of the mind, all of that comes from karma yoga. So Krishna says, transform your activities into karma yoga. You don't have to give up all that. You can still be in the midst of all activities and family and all of that and become a Vedantin and become enlightened too. 
change is necessary renunciation is necessary but krishna moves it inwards psychological so now what becomes of karma karma is all your daily activities not just a little bit of philanthropy or some little um, you know um, rituals all your daily activities which you might have earlier considered secular all of that now becomes spiritualized the goal is purification of mind i do all these activities as worship of god so that is karma yoga taught by krishna you can see it's a radical rethinking of what action is in the way that it was more more clear cut the action portion and the knowledge portion and it sort of followed though the vedas did not say that openly but it sort of followed you would have two different kinds of life there would be a household life there would be a monastic life and that's why sort of monastic life was at that time open for everybody and everybody was expected if you want moksha you would become a monk like krishna said it's you have to become monk like renunciation is important it's not exactly that um, you have to give up your uh, your status or your duties as a warrior do that now as a worship of god spiritualize your daily life spiritualize your daily activities even the so called secular activities now notice one thing so this is all in context of what that scholar told me how is vivekananda revolutionary notice already from the vedas to krishna a huge uh, transformation a paradigm shift has happened not just a few rituals not just a few acts of philanthropy but all your activities in the day your family your job your community all those activities are now spiritual acts i am worshiping my lord through those acts okay now fast forward to vivekananda 19th century how is that a further advance over krishna's karma yoga vivekananda's karma yoga so when the vivekananda's karma yoga follows from uh, rama shri ramakrishna shiva gyane jiva seva service to uh, all sentient beings knowing them to be shiva knowing them knowing that jiva is shiva all living beings are that that ultimate reality uh, just now i was walking in central park so one of these persons i know who hangs out there he has this little dog and so once in a while he catches me with a with a philosophical question so as i was just coming out of the park just about 30 uh, one hour ago he caught me and he said uh, swami this little fellow a little chihuahua i think this little fellow does he have thoughts and feelings does he have awareness i said yes he is a sentient being just like us there is almost tears in his eyes i said thank you swami we know that we you know that we appreciate you so, so i have this um, interesting set of friends there in the park some of them are the last of the hippies some of them are um they they, are, they spend all day singing um beatles songs there in the strawberry field and all sorts of people some of them are also high and that's the other the thing altogether so you have a whole assorted set but so all sentient beings are they are not just individual little beings they are all they are all shiva and i'm worshiping shiva through my acts the acts what are acts service to sentient beings especially service to humanity now how is this more than what krishna said it's not just your daily activities it is not just as a method of purifying your mind rather it will purify your mind and all your daily activities are included but much more than that it is service to humanity at large even all sentient beings at large something beyond your daily activities so for example transforming society so i vivekananda said the two great sins of india the neglect of uh, the oppression of the masses and the neglect of women now transforming society a better more just more equitable society that is not part of your daily round of duties that's not what krishna was talking about when he said to when he talked to arjuna arjuna says this whatever your duties are do them as worship of god and the vedic idea of ishta purta was among all your duties one part of it is uh, rituals another part of it is charity plus you have many secular stuff a lot of secular stuff to do so you can see the changes in paradigm you have a duty to you have a you know your your service to the whole of society so a society free of the inequities of caste or race or gender um, a society where all your actions are rendered up as worship to the divine in all beings 
that that's the attitude so it's a even more powerful karma yoga than what krishna had taught and certainly that was itself a huge advance over the ishta purta which is mentioned in the vedas further one more point and i'll move ahead what swami vivekananda was saying is is actually the expression of an enlightened person see when krishna teaches arjuna when the buddha teaches humanity christ teaches uh, humanity are they teaching in order to purify their own are they first of all are they te- teaching so that they can go to heaven they don't care for the, the temporary heavens uh, so it's not like the ishta purta idea not for good karma or is it like krishna's karma yoga where you are doing that as a preparation for vedantic knowledge as a purification of the mind to inculcate selflessness and discipline no krishna and uh, christ and uh, shankara and ramakrishna uh, buddha they are already enlightened they are far beyond that so why are they serving humanity why are they doing good to humanity it's an expression of their enlightenment they see the oneness they cannot do otherwise it's an exp- that that love that oh, that compassion that comes for everybody is an expression of their enlightenment it's not something they're doing as a practice for their own benefit even spiritual benefit now that attitude sri ramakrishna would call it the attitude of a vigyani that can also be practiced by us even before enlightenment that becomes the philosophy now so it's a vaster much broader um, idea of karma yoga here karma yoga becomes an expression of enlightenment it becomes the same as gyana yoga then okay let's stop there i didn't say it in all these details to that pandit he wouldn't have he would have been annoyed but this is my answer to that pandit who told me what is the advance of vivekananda over ishta purta mentioned in the vedas this is the advance moving on so he offers three boons now nachiketa speaks to yama so this is a famous part of the dialogue you know where yama offers three boons and nachiketa asks the first one the second one and the third one um before i read out the verse the mantra notice the three boons of nachiketa if you take a big picture look at it everybody concentrates on the third one uh, the third one is that uh, about atman where the whole teaching about vedanta starts that's why people get impatient no hurry it up it's just the story when is when is vedanta going to start but the story is very good it teaches many things but if you look at the first second and third boons the first boon is that you know let me go back home and, um, and my, when i go back home my father will recognize me my father let my father be fine you know he wants his father not to be angry with him it's very cute for you can see that he's a little boy he's very worried that his father is mad at him that's the first thing he asks the second thing he asks is what's the best possible fire ritual karma kanda the whole karma portion of the vedas you know which he sees his father and his uh, all the people in his community they are very busy performing these rituals so show me you know like a little boy the best one i want the best teach me what's the best one the third one is about atman enlightenment now if you look at it take the big picture exactly what has he done he has asked for something in this world about his parents about his family and you know, to settle the problems there he has asked for something in the next world to how to go to heaven after death and the best possible heaven and finally he has asked for enlightenment and moksha freedom basically he has covered all the bases <laughs> yeah, whatever one could ask for but in a very enlightened way uh, he in the worldly sense he is just worried about his father and that's it doesn't want anything for himself but his father let let my father be happy with me again that's a big thing for a kid and then heaven what all these grown ups are worried about going to heaven going to heaven let me go to heaven that's that's also great and third uh, the ultimate question what's all this what's the point of it what's going on here what is the secret of of death of life and death uh, i want to know that so that's the big picture the first boon verse number 10 mantra number 10 shanta sankalpa sumana yatha syat vitamanyur gautamo ma bhi mrityu tvat prasrishtam ma bhi vadet pratita etat trayanam prathamam varam rine o death of the three boons i ask this one as the first 
namely that my father, Gautama, may become free from anxiety, calm of mind, freed from anger towards me, and he may recognize me and talk to me when freed by you. What a kid. See, he is quite innocently. Notice how many things he has packed into one boon. If you actually count, he says, first and most important, he just takes it for granted. I'm going back home. That's what you would be scared about when you say go to the house of death is that that's it. My life is over. I'm dying. It doesn't even seem to occur to him. He's so innocent about it. He's not even asking that reverse death. Let me go back to life. He says, when, I, when you send me back home, I'm not going to go back. You are going to send me back home. So I'm going to go back home. That's, that's of course, given. You can see uh, Yama smiling, you know, <laughs> a little smile on his lips, the thing twinkle in his eyes when he hears all this. And so many other things. The ask is very big. Uh, my father, let him be freed of ang anxiety. So the commentator says, what kind of anxiety? His father must be sad. His, father must, his father's mind must be a mixture of anger and misery and, uh, uh, and, uh, and anxiety. What's that little boy doing? How is he faring in the house of death, in the land of death? So let him be free of ang anxiety till the point I go back. Of course, he'll see me. But before that, right now, let him, let him relax. Let, him be, let him, his mind be set at, at ease. That's one, if you count that way. And then let him become calm. That is... Um, we uh, this is you know the sanskrit word is sumana a wholesome mind a serene mind free of anxiety happy mind let's put it this way happy mind then we the manu free of anger he's worried about that one because dad was mad at me the last time i saw, saw him so let him not be angry with me and then the um, uh, next one that um, he may recognize me when I go back, so another thing occurs to him. If I go back and doesn't recognize me, that's no good. Because he might think I am a ghost. So, and all of this is supplied by the sub-sub commentators. One commentator says, come back from dead. He looks like our son. And so he must be a ghost. The, you know, when we were kids, we had uh, comics, American comics. Those were expensive to come by. But we had stuff like Batman, Superman. But there was also another one, Casper. It was the, the friendly ghost. So his dad might get scared, you know, that this boy must be a ghost. So to, to take care of that, he asks Yama, the Lord of Death, to fix that. Don't let him think I'm a ghost. Let him recognize me and let him talk to me nicely, as he used to talk to me earlier. Let him be nice to me. Notice how many, I was just sitting and counting. First of all, freed from death and go back home. And that also death has to arrange. See, he came on his own, but he has to be sent back by death. So death has to pay for his flight back. That's one. And that's taken for granted. The second one is that uh, my father, let him, be, let him be peaceful right now. Let him be free of anxiety. Third one is, let him be happy in mind. Uh, the fourth one is, let his anger towards me go. And the fifth one is, let him recognize me. Let him not think that I'm a ghost. And the sixth one is, let him um, talk to me nicely like the way he used to earlier. So all of this, and as you get quite innocently, uh, without the slightest hesitation, he thinks it's one boon. And so <laughs> there is a saying in, uh, in Bengali, Shonar uh, Pathor Bati, which is a golden stone plate and uh, bowls. So you can't have a stone and a gold plate, it, but both, you want both. It's like the story goes, there was a man who worshipped, who prayed to God and Shiva. Shiva appears before him and says, I'll give you a boon. What do you want? One boon. And the man said, I want to eat a hearty meal on gold plates with my grandchildren. Which means he is going to be married and have children and have grandchildren, live long enough to have grandchildren and be healthy enough to eat a hearty meal and be rich enough to have golden plates, all of that in one boom. So Nachiketa accomplished something like this there. <laughs> and you can just imagine the twinkle in Yama's uh, eyes, you know, when he, when he grants it. And Nachiketa makes it very clear, this is the first boom. 
The other wounds are not used up yet. Only one, I'm using up only one for all of this. Then death says, Yatha purastat bhavita pratita audyalaki raruni matra srishta sukham ratri shaita vita manyu tvam dadrishavan mrityu mukhat pramuktam. Having recognized, having recognized you, Audalaki Aruni will be possessed of affection just as he had before. Seeing you freed from the jaws of death, he will get over his anger and will, with my permission, sleep happily, happily for many a night. So he grants all of that. Whatever you asked for, everything. You, your, your father will relax. Um, you will go back from death by, and he'll recognize you. He'll be delighted to see you that you're back from death. He will love you just like he loved, early, uh, loved you earlier. All his anger will be gone. All of that, done. You get all of what you asked for. Just a little, completely unnecessary, but because the commentators um, wrangle over it. Notice the names keep shifting. So his father's name was Vajasravasan. In the earlier mantra, his name is my father Gautama. Now, they had different names. Each person, especially the esteemed ones, you know, it was prestigious to have multiple names. So it's quite possible his name was Vajasravasa um, because he was the son of Vajasrava. And his, his own name, his father's, Nachiketa's father's own name was Gautama. But then this gets worse. In this mantra, you have two more names, Adyalaki Aruni all referring to Nashiketa's father. No, this gets a bit too much. That's four names already. So what's going on here? Uh, Shankaracharya gives some explanations and they're complicated ones. Um, and sub commentators give some explanation. All of it is not pertinent to us, but I'll just give you a sample of what's going on here. It also gives an insight into the Vedic culture of these people. So the complicated answer is, um, there is a term Shankaracharya uses, Dvayamushyayana, which means uh, uh, a person who can claim descent from two lineages. Why would this happen? The, uh, the crucial thing is a very important ritual for Hindus, even today, is the Pindadana. So when ancestors pass away, uh, fathers, mothers, grandparents, great grandparents, you are offered, you are supposed to offer a ritual. In the ritual uh, to your ancestors, a rice ball is offered. That's called the pinda. So that's very important. And why is that important? The belief is that uh, um, this helps the departed ancestors to attain to higher worlds. So you would want your son. And ritualistically, it was the son who was supposed to perform these rituals, not the daughter. Although nowadays even daughters can do it. I, I have seen it being done. So it's important that you have a son and that son uh, does this ritual for you uh, when you're dead and gone. So it's Pindalana. Now imagine uh, a person who does not have a son, but has a daughter. Now, one arrangement they used to make was when this daughter gets married and if she has a son, then the arrangement would be that son would not only offer the rice ball, the pinda, for his father, that is the daughter's husband, his son-in-law, but also for the daughter's father. So he would act ritualistically as the son for uh, the daughter's father and also for the daughter and her husband. So it's like having two lineages, one coming from the mother's side, the, the father there, and one his own father. Okay, how does this all help us? Uh, this helps us because now, we have two lineages here. Audyalaki Aruni. So, and all this is about Nachiketa's father. So Nachiketa's father, uh, his, uh, his father would have been Uddalaka and his mother's father uh, might have been Aruna, the Rishi Aruna. Although another interpretation is his mother would be uh, Aruna. So w one of these possibilities. If that sounds all complicated, doesn't mean much. It just is try, try, struggling to explain why there's, there's such a variety of names for 
Nachiketa's father, who is anyway a sort of side player for the whole story. So Uddalaki Aruni, because Nachiketa's father might be one such case where the agreement was he would not not only offer the sacred rice balls for his mother and father when they pass, but also for his mother's father. Uh, so two lineages are in him. All right. So that was the first boon. And Nachiketa gets a very good deal, I think. He gets whatever he wants. He, uh, all those uh, demands are satisfied. Let me quickly look at the comments. So Rick says he had a near-death experience. Yes, today we might call it that, an NDE, a near-death experience. And Punita the by beyond death experience. Oh, beyond, okay, B Y. It's being shared with us. Shubhadeep says Yama, who is supposed to be an enlightened person, bothered about losing his good karma. I guess not, but it's a part of the story. Don't ask too much; it'll ruin the story. Or he just might be setting a good example. Just might be good setting a good example for the rest of us. Don't neglect the guest. And again, Yama uh, himself, uh, he's enlightened because he will teach the, the truth about the Atman, about the self. But then all these concerns were raised by his family. So maybe he doesn't want his family to suffer. So Yama has also a wife and he has got a family or he has a kingdom. He has this whole department to run, the department of death. He doesn't want its budget to be slashed. God with the capital G might slash the budget budget for the department of death. So he's quite quite the bureaucrat. So he's protecting his uh, his bureaucratic empire. Yes, good. Um, all right, I think that's uh, enough for today because the next question takes us to an entirely different level, where uh, we take a quick look look at. This entire field, this entire uh, um, this culture of Vedic sacrifices. So we'll be, although this is an Upanishad, it's supposed to be beyond the uh, the limits of Vedic sacrifices. We've gone beyond that, but it's you can see how the Upanishads are solidly set in the Vedic culture of those times. The terms are there. As so people follow those, had those beliefs. Uh, the practices are the same, and. People still want that. Even Nachiketa asks for the secret of the best kind of Vedic sacrifice. All right. Prashchit comes to mind. Uh, Prashchit, in what sense? For neglecting the guests. Yes. So for neglecting the guests, that he, he might be uh, he might be feeling bad about. Um, he may not be particularly concerned about good karma or bad karma, but yes, he has neglected the guest and he wants to atone for that. So, prashtita are the acts of atonement. So, the Vedic rites are related to prashtit, isn't it? There are Vedic rites of various kinds. There are nitya karma, daily rites to be done, like Agnihotra, the daily rituals, which are part of the Ishta. There are prashtita karmas, which are uh, atonement rites. So, if one feels that one has, or if one knows that one has committed sins or mistakes or lapses, one might go through those rituals to atone for that. Um, and they are karmya karmas. There are specific rituals uh, which will help you to satisfy specific desires. Some of them might be worldly, you know, wealth and rainfall and uh, children curing a disease, all of that in this world, going to heaven and a selection of heavens were available to you. You can go to the you know, to the Bahamas or to to uh, the Hawaii or to Fiji, so a selection of heavenly places are available to you. And that also depends upon the kind of ritual you perform. So there are different kinds of ritual. Beyond all of this was enlightenment, God realization. All right. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu